Welcome, and thank you for joining me on the Listen by Heart podcast. I'm your host, Jasmine Lowe. It began as Listen to Your Heart, a project that began as a TED Talk in 2016, albeit a botched recording and my nervous energy that translated into giggles. It was unplanned, And it was one of those strings of serendipitous events that started when my mum was diagnosed with a non-malignant brain tumour that needed to be removed. A fixer saw that that news sent me on a tumble, on a search for answers. Why did the tumour grow? What would she need to recover? Does our body heal on its own? How do dietary nutrition or the lack of affect cell growth and the marvel of vibrational frequencies within us and surrounding us. As ethereal as this may sound, that has translated into this Listen by Heart podcast. I'd like to share with you a famous speech that Nelson Mandela never gave. It's titled Our Deepest Fear and for the records, My research shows that this passage was often attributed to Nelson Mandela, but it was in fact a quote in a New York Times best-selling book titled A Return to Love by Marianne Williamson, published in 1992. Marianne is an American author, lecturer and co-founder of a volunteer food delivery program in Los Angeles. She also co-founded a peace alliance. So here's this peace dedicated to all of us. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, or fabulous. Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to manifest the glory of God that is within us. It's not just in some of us, It's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Thank you to the author Marianne Williamson for this quote that has made its way into the hearts of so many people. Hello. Oh, I like the hair. <laughs> Inspired by the Orang Pinan from Sarawak. Is that a DIY haircut or did you go to the salon? Introducing to you Karina Robles Bahrin Wong, author and hotelier. Karina's done her bachelor's in international relations, class of 1992, Stanford University in California, USA. She was the recipient of Public Services Department of Malaysia's scholarship. She was also attending in 1991 the Stanford in Oxford summer program. And she's a class of 1986 Asunta Secondary School from Petaling Jaya, Selangor. Do you know Marianne Williamson? No. Funny enough, she published a book called A Return to Love. 1992, mm-hmm. Los Angeles, New York Times bestseller. And that's the same year that you graduated from Stanford. Uh-huh. Yeah, 92. Welcome to Season 4 of the Listen by Heart podcast, where we feature stories from women of the South China Sea. I'm your host, Jasmine Lowe, and on this audio journey, we welcome Karina Robles Bahrain a Malaysian author and hotelier. Karina was shortlisted for the Epigram Fiction Prize 2022 when we first spoke to her, but we're very happy to announce to you that she has won 
that particular prize and her novel will be published by Epigram in the fourth quarter of 2022. Let's cross over to the 99 islands of Langkawi right now. Hello, Karina. How are you? Hi, Jasmine. Good, thank you. Nice to, to see you again on screen. It's been ages since I've been to La Pari Pari. Yeah, it's nice to see you looking, you know, all chirpy and healthy. Considering I've just uh, recovered from COVID as well. Exactly. <laughs> so from one big island down south here in Australia to 99 islands up to the, mm, let's see, what latitude is it? Uh, in Langkawi, <laughs> Kada. Uh, um, where is home to you, Karina? Um, Malaysia at large, I think, is what I would say. Yeah. Although, although I suppose where my roots are at the moment would be Langkawi. I've, I've been here for ten years now. Has it um, been ten years? Yeah, ten years. Um, actually, I moved here at the end of 2011, so it's a bit more than ten years now. And what, what happened? I mean, you were a corporate. You know, head honcho. Um, seriously, I mean, you you were you were the media relations queen in Kuala Lumpur, and <laughs> suddenly I hear through the grapevine that she's opening up a resort. Tell us a little bit more about that. How did that happen? Oh, it, it was a gradual process. Uh, I think people have midlife crises. I probably had a quarter one. I don't know, uh, but I, I decide. I think as I approached. Turning 40, um, I began to realize that there's not much else that a career in uh, public relations could really offer me that, that, that I wanted, really. I mean, I, I'd already headed an agency. I was already, you know, head of the communications team in, in a very large sort of quasi government linked company. So, I mean, the next steps would have been either to go on into a regional role, which I had also already done, or go and work for the government, which I didn't want to do. <laughs> so I thought, okay, uh, time to strike out on my own and do something else. Um, and, and I decided to move to Langkawi. Is, is there a hotelier in your family? No. Oh, uh, hospitality? No. Nothing. No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Did not know anything. But I mean, you know... I, in trying to figure out what sort of, of, of field I could go into as an entrepreneur, um, I figured the best thing to do would be to go into a field where if my workers decided to up and leave, I could still do the job myself. So, <laughs> Which explains your Facebook posts. <laughs> yeah, well, at the moment, we still end up doing a lot of it ourselves, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, running a hotel is basically making beds you know, cleaning toilets, well, checking get, people in and out. B besides all of that, um, the hard work, the hard stuff behind the scenes, get, paint us a picture of what it's like right now from where you are in Langkawi. What, what is it like on this island? Oh, well, uh, you know, things have changed drastically because of COVID, right? Mm -hmm. um, although the island has opened back up and Langkawi is now a designated what you call travel bubble destination. So for inbound tourists uh, or inbound uh, visitors who want to come to Malaysia, they can come and, and stay in Langkawi for seven days without having to be quarantined. Um, of course, they have to go through you know rigorous testing. Uh, but once they've cleared those seven days, they're then allowed to you know go to other parts of the country. But despite that, um, travel, of course, has not recovered to you know the the pre-COVID levels, so things are just slowly picking up, and I think all the businesses are, you know, still slowly trying to find their footing and figure out how quickly they should expand or not, given you know the uncertainty of things still. Well, I, I remember visiting uh, Langkawi back in the nineties. I I was uh, posted to. Malaysia, and I was working on a Commonwealth Games uh, pullout for a travel magazine, and I still remember walking one kilometer into the the um, the jungle, um, and there was a Thai restaurant. I think it, it was called Ban Thai. That's what yes, it yes, was yes. called. 
So at that time in the 90s, Langkawi was just so amazingly pristine, untouched. Um, is it like that now in Langkawi? Can people still expect that kind of, you know, remoteness? Uh, yes, in, in spots. Um, in fact, you know, Langkawi is an archipelago, right? There's there's 99 islands, depending on the tide, sometimes 103. But so there are other islands you can go to apart from the main one. And that's that's what I always tell people. Like if you actually want to, you know, enjoy the real beauty of the islands, um, the best thing to do is to take a boat out from from the main one and, and just take a, you know, day trip um, out to kind of the outlying islands where, you know, some of them, most of them are largely still uninhabited. Really? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, except for maybe two other ones. Uh, and even the two that are inhabited, Pulau Tuba and um, Dayan Bunting, um, they, they only have very small villages, maybe kind of uh, tiny little clutch of chalets and stuff. So, yeah, you can still you can still enjoy possibly what you did, you know, in the 90s, just maybe not on the main island itself. Right, okay. But I, I, I would imagine there's a lot more five-star big boys on the island the, yeah of course of course there, there are I mean uh, quite a few of them are here now so congratulations I mean not only have you built a award winning resort you've now got the epigram uh, book prize under your belt uh, how did that happen I mean <laughs> you must share you must share well um, I've always wanted to write a book uh, so the thing is, when I moved to Langkawi, one of the things I thought was going to happen is I would have some time to write, right? <laughs> Which is a stupid thing to even think. Uh, because, you know, when you're an entrepreneur and starting a business, plus, you know, you're entering a sector you have zero experience in, oh, uh, really, you don't have time for anything else. Um, <laughs> you know. So you've got, to battle, you've got to battle the cows, the kerbows. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> Everything. Monitor lizards, monkeys, you name it. And then people. <laughs> <laughs> and then some. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, but yeah, so so the writing didn't happen, basically. And how many years ago was that when you first set up? Did you say 2011? Uh, 2011, we moved here uh, with my dogs and everything I possessed. And then in 2012, we actually opened the resort. So I moved here towards the end of the resort's construction phase. How long was construction? Only about a year. Really? Yeah, yeah. Well done. Well done. And you're saying that you deep dived into this without knowing or even having any experience in construction before? Yeah. <laughs> I don't recommend it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, constructing a book and constructing a resort, <laughs> which one's easier? Book, book. Book? Because, yes, because, you know, there's a lot more within your control, right? It's just you and the page. But the time. Resort, you have to deal with contractors. <laughs> so, the book took you like 11 years, but the, the resort took you a year. Well, I mean, to be fair, I wasn't writing the book this entire time. I mean, before I moved to Langkawi, I already had kind of little fragments of the book. I mean, the story idea has been sitting with me for a long time. Um, but when it finally came down to drafting the book, the, the actual first draft was probably only done in about three or four months. Yeah. But the idea was already, it was, you were told. Yes. Did you yes. note it down anywhere? Like, did you have a notebook and were you like consciously constructing this book um yes and no but like i said i actually started with little kind of fragments of writing um that were already you know so they, those existed on my hard drive for more than 10 years um and i i left them aside uh, but I knew that the very essence of the book was just, you know, this this main character who discovers that she's Malay. Mm. So I, I knew that that would be, you know, what the book is about. But I hadn't plotted it. I hadn't, you know, really figured it out. And actually, once I finally started drafting it, I think the storyline um, surprised me a little mm. in terms of the direction that it eventually took. And why did you choose to go fiction? I mean, you could very well have shared stories about your own life Um, but why go the way of fiction? 
I've I've always enjoyed fiction. Okay. I mean, that's that's kind of my playground, you know. Um, and and but the ambition was always to write a novel, not to write memoir, or, you know, anything like that. Um, so yeah, it's just it's just my happy place. <laughs> nice. Um, the short stories that you've written in the past are they are they still available? I mean, I can can people go on Goodreads or Amazon and find them? I don't know. I think because they were done by local publishers, and I think they tend to publish kind of small batches. I'm not sure that they do reprints. In fact, um, you know, there is one of the books that I was in that I really wish the publisher would reprint because I think it's a it's a fabulous book. The one by ZI Publishing, mm-hmm. uh, Malaysian Tales. Um, a beautiful cover look. Can you see it? Oh, it's a bit blur. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's very. It's very pretty. Definitely. Very pretty book. Definitely is the editor, right? Yeah, yeah. Because um, two interviews back, we had um, Anne Lee on. Ah, her, yeah. So she read from a story in here. That's right. That's yeah. right. Uh, that's yeah. lovely. I, I I couldn't get a copy of it. No, mm. it's very hard to get. I've been telling Ezra, I was like, you should reprint this book because, you know, the, the whole premise of Malaysian Tales was to get authors to reinterpret old Malaysian fables and legends. Yeah. Um, and this is based on a concept for... for uh, of a Western book, it's called something like "My Mother She Ate Me, My Father He Killed Me," or something like that. Which is again, you know, just reinterpretation of Grimm's fairy tales, etc. So Ezra, if Ezra Zayed, right? If you're yes. listening, yes, please consider reprinting it or having a digital <laughs> version available. Because he's got some really amazing authors in there. I mean, Rehman Rashid's in there, Prita Samarasan's yep. in there, mm-hmm. and Otiam Chin's in there. There's big names in there. Karina, let's let's go back a little bit. Uh, a little bit. Let's go back to your childhood. If you're happy okay. to share, I would love to know a little bit more about your childhood. What, what was it like growing up, and where were you growing up? Ah, so both my parents are academics, right? My father is a geographer. My mother is a psychology uh, um, a professor. So I grew up in an academic household um, for the the first six years of my life. We actually grew up in the University of Malaya quarters because my father was a professor there. Um, So it was a life full of books, (laughs) a lot of reading. Um, And I think that's where I picked up the habit. Uh, That must have been nice. Uh, You're talking about UM in Kuala Lumpur, right? Yeah, the, heart of Kuala yes, Lumpur. the houses in PJ. If you remember those bungalows, yeah. I lived on the same road as University Hospital. Okay. So there, there was a, an enclave there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> and and what was it like? I mean, how how many of you in your family? Uh so this is my parents, and then I'm the eldest. I've got the brother in the middle, and then my sister. So we're a family of five, and we had um, dogs and cats, and I think at one point a duck and a chicken. <laughs> So that was that was also really the arterial road um, into PJ, isn't it? It was yeah. It was the road that connected um, Bangsa PJ University Hospital, the EPF building, all of these signature buildings, and Federal Highway along Kuala Lumpur, right? Bringing you from Kuala Lumpur to to Shah Alam. So living. And growing up in the, that area, you must have gone to a PJ school. Um, the thing is, I was only there till I was six, right? And ah. Then uh, we picked up and moved to Shah Alam, uh, which is the, at the time the relatively new state capital of Slango. Um, because of that, we, all of us three kids then went to school in Klang. So I completed my primary schooling in Klang um, and then subsequently moved back to a, a PJ for secondary school um, in Asunta. So I was always in a girl's school though. You know, I was in the Methodist girls' school in Klang and then I went to the Asunta, you know, uh, school in, um, in, in PJ. Uh, tell us a little bit about your family background. I mean, like uh, dad, I mean, if you're happy to share uh, and you sent me some really amazing photos, <laughs> uh, dad and his, his family, the women in your family, Oh wow! So, uh, so starting with my dad's side, I suppose that is the side that I actually know a little bit more because you know they're they're here in Malaysia. Um, my grandmother, 
on that side was pretty much the matriarch. I have memories of how、um, she used to take money out from her bra every time Grandpa wanted to go to the coffee shop. You know? This this is Daddy's <laughs> mum, is it? My, my dad's mom. Oh, okay. Yeah, so my paternal grandmother in Negri Sembilan. So you know, Negri Sembilan、uh, uh, is a stay in Malaysia that is known for its its Minangkabau women, which is a mat in the matrilineal society. Okay. Right. So so the Negri women are traditionally known to be quite strong and and sort of the heads of the household in a lot of ways. So my grandmother obviously controlled the purse strings. <laughs> <laughs> Because Grandpa had to get money from her even just to go and have coffee with his friends, right? And we always knew that during、uh, Idol Fitri celebrations, when it's you know it's customary to give children little money packets, she would always give you the bigger one, you know, she because she had more money than it. She's a really feisty lady. And what was what was she doing? What was she doing? Well, I mean, she basically just、uh, raised her children. But you know, I, I think she had quite a remarkable childhood.、Um, my grandmother was actually, and we found this out later. I didn't know this growing up. Found it out when I was an adult. She and her sister were actually adopted into a Malay family. Um, um, she and her sister were actually biologically Chinese. According to my dad, they came from the family that ran the goldsmith shop in their in their little town. But I've I, I've never met anybody from that side.、Um, but she was raised a Malay, so you know culturally and in just you know、uh, she understood the world from a Malay point of view.、Um, I think she had a lot of she was like I said quite feisty. I have a very distinct memory of her when I was a child of her sitting kind of at the, the you know the door. In her little chair, she'd do that every evening, and she'd be sitting there smoking her unfiltered cigarettes. <laughs> you know, camels. Nothing away. Yeah, I, I don't know what they were. Maybe camel staring at a rambutan tree. You know, I mean, I, I've never seen my grandpa smoke, but she used to smoke. So she was you know. very comfortable in her skin. <laughs> very. I mean, she'd sit there in her sarong, you know, and look at the sky. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> really cool. And、um, what other memories do you have from from that time? And this was in which town in Negri Sembilan? Ah, a little town called Kuala Pila. I see. Okay. <laughs> I think I've driven past it once. Yeah, yeah. Do share. I mean, what what we're trying to do now is trying to paint this picture of the women who came before you, right?、Yeah. And the men too. I've learned from my、um, past podcast with Chua Gua Eng. Our、uh, Malaysian female novelist, the first Malaysian female novelist, that in her life men mattered more. So it's important, I think,、uh, when I first started this project, it was very much talking about the women who influenced us, and we came about to this because at、uh, one time we were at a dinner table and we were asking around. So what was the name of your grandma? Nobody knew her name. They just knew her as. Ama or grandma or nene, you know. So, what was the name of your grandma? Can you remember? Wan Pute. Wow. <laughs> Wan、yeah. Pute. And she really was Pute. She was very fair. I mean, she looked really Chinese.、Um, you know. And yeah, but she was a housewife.、Um, but because she, you know, like I said, she was adopted into a family of of, of some means.、Um, She apparently went to school in a convent. You know, she used to ride a chauffeur-driven car, and she'd go and, and study in the convent. And I didn't realize until I was probably I don't know fourteen or something that she actually understood English because we always spoke to her in Malay, right? And she spoke in in in, in the Negri dialect、mm -hmm. um, in Malay.、Um, <laughs> what so, what does the Negri dialect sound like? Can you rattle off a little bit? No, no, I can't. You, I you don't speak. Uh -huh. So then one day she's sitting there and she's smoking, you know, sitting there and, and staring at the sky. And she turned to me and said, "What do you want to have for dinner tonight? Pumpkin." And I almost fell off my chair. I <laughs> went running to my dad and I said, "Do you know she speaks English?" <laughs> <laughs> Things that like, you learn. <laughs> yeah, I mean, why she suddenly chose to show me at a much older age that she actually, all this time, understood what we were saying. I don't know. But, so yeah,、funny. it was quite a revelation for me. So, so I suppose, I mean, as we do, you would have gone back to visit grandma and grandpa during the weekends and so, such. Um, not so much the weekends because those days you didn't have highways, yeah.、Uh, and to get to Kuala Pila, 
um, from KL or the Klang Valley. Uh, the last part of the journey, you had to go through this little windy road through an area called Bukit Putus. And I remember all of us, you know, just feeling really awful and caustic. <laughs> funny, <laughs> funny that it's called Bukit Putus because in Australia, there's such a place and it's called Broken Hill. Oh, really? <laughs> wow. I mean, nowadays to get to Kuala Pila, it's a straight highway, you know. But I mean, those days, it was a bit of a journey. So we would go back during um, Idol Fitri or Hari Raya. We'd go back during school holidays. Um, and Hari Raya was fun because all the cousins would come back. So my, my dad comes from a family of about eight, nine siblings. So you imagine all of them coming back, you know, and, and converging. And their families. Um, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, in, in, in the Kampong house. And I actually, now that I look back on that, I realize that my, my brother's sibling, uh, children and my sister's children will never have that kind of experience, you know, of kind of being with the extended family under one roof for a period of time. Um, I think that's something that we've lost now. So it's a real shame. It's a real shame. Yeah. Well, um, is the family home still there? Um. I don't think so. So my grandparents were moved to Bangsa in the 80s because um, of their health. I think my uh, their children felt that they needed to be closer to you know hospitals, and because most of the children were in KL, it, it was easier then for them to take care of them. They moved them to Bangsa. So my grandparents lived in very hip Bangsa, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> while the granddaughter lived in the boonies. Um, <laughs> and, yeah. So, yeah, um, the home was then, I think it's been demolished now. But I also learned from my dad that the home that my, my grandparents lived in um, didn't really belong to them. So because of, of the way the Minangkabau society uh, is structured, I think it belonged to the clan. So once my grandparents exited the, the property, it, it then went back into the larger family. So oh, it, never, it wasn't really theirs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they had the right of abode. Pretty much something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how about how about mum's side? I understand mum has a very interesting history as well. Oh, mum. And so is... mum's from mum's from the Philippines, right? Okay. Okay. So that's where the your interesting name comes from. Yeah. That's that's the Rob. That's that's her maiden name. Uh huh. Um, and my um my mother comes from a very large family, sixteen um children. Wow. From one set, one set of parents. Okay. <laughs> and my mother is number sixteen, and she is currently she's currently now the last surviving um, child from that marriage. Um, of course, you know the, the, the subsequent generations. There's lots of us, but my mum's the, the last one left. Um, so Grandpa uh, worked in a bank. I think he was a manager in a bank. My grandmother was a housewife, but she was also a photographer. <sighs> What an emancipated woman! I know, right? So she used to be. She's a portrait photographer. So apparently, she used to do this, you know, to earn some extra money. Um, because you know, although her husband had a decent job, because he had sixteen children, had to stretch so you know across so many beings, they weren't. They were very poor. <laughs> so, but this was in Manila. Ah uh, no, this was in um in uh, in, in one of the provinces, mm-hmm. Cabanatuan, Nueva Ecija is, is where they're from, and the family home is still there. That that one's still there. What, what and my was, cousins currently live there. What was that place called again? Nueva Ecija. Is that sort of like uh, which part of Philippines is it? Um, it's I mean it's drivable from Manila. I mean in those days it would take anywhere from five to eight hours. I understand now it's only a couple hours. Wow. Um, again, because of you know the way roads are have improved and things like that now. Have, have you been? Uh, have you been to? Yeah, yeah, I've been, I've been, but not in a very, very long time now. I mean, I've I've gone back to the Philippines since, but only to Manila. Um, I've not gone back to the province uh, where some of my cousins still live. I think one of them is still living in a family home. So you're really the epitome of uh, a Southeast Asian woman. Yeah, I'm all over the place. <laughs> so you want to hear about how my parents met? I do, I sure do. Actually, I'm really curious. How did they meet? Must have been at university, right? They met in Delhi. <laughs> okay, a conference? <laughs> yeah. uh- <laughs> so I, there you go. But even, even then, I struggled to understand why they were at the same conference because my dad was a geographer. My mother was a psychologist. I'm like, what are the two of you doing in a conference? 
And what was the conference? Do you know? I don't know. <laughs> I should ask them. Like, why were you there at the same time? But yes, so they were at this conference in Delhi and they met,、um, and then proceeded to correspond with each other, right?、And、they share the know, same alumni, perhaps. I mean, they were, you know, obviously in different universities. I mean, they all went. They both went to universities in their own countries. My dad went to UM. My mother, you know, was in the the university in the Philippines.、Um, so they were at this conference. They met. And my mother says that at one point during the conference, I think my dad and he, you know when you when you hear things like this about your parents, you're like I don't think you're capable. I, I can't even imagine my dad being this romantic. Apparently, he broke into the the Delhi Gardens because they had gates and they were locked. He broke into it to kind of just behead a bunch of roses so he could give them to her. I'm like, wow, mom, he gave you stolen flowers. <laughs> So sweet. Yeah. So yeah. So then they did. They proceeded to correspond. I believe for almost two years or something. And as I understand it, my father finally got fed up, and he decided to fly to Manila.、Uh, my mom was in Manila at the point, and and told her, I said, okay, it's like this: either you get married with me, or we're not gonna be friends anymore. Very very convincing sort of、uh, proposal, and yeah, well,、uh, she obviously said. <laughs> she said yes. They had a civil ceremony, right? In, in the Philippines. In the Philippines, and apparently, you know, he was that unprepared. He didn't even have a ring,、uh, so he had to borrow a ring from his friend. <laughs>、mm-hmm. Something yeah, borrowed. So no, all, there you yeah, go. Something borrowed, right? So、uh, you know they had this this the、uh, registered marriage, a little reception in my aunt's house or something, and then they came back here. You've sent me some amazing photos of your family, and this is mum, right? Yeah, that's mum. Well, I would have I would have flown all the way to the Philippines and make a proposal as well if I was him. <laughs> yeah, but get this, he didn't tell anybody here in Malaysia that he was going to do this. So he comes back with this tiny waif of a woman because she was really tiny then, and she said that she tells it. She says, "There's that there, there." I came with the one suitcase. She says, first of all, as the airplane's coming in, all I can see is like jungle, and I'm thinking, what have I got myself into? And I didn't understand this because I was like, "Yeah, but you just came from the Philippines." But the Philippines then, in the sixties, was a lot more developed than Kuala Lumpur.、Right. I mean, Manila was already a metropolis, so she went from a, a big city to suddenly, oh my god, right? So, so that was what year? That was probably in the sixties, right? Sixty-seven, I guess. So about yeah, ten years yeah. after independence, correct? It was so, still very much. Still new, yeah.、Um, so they landed, and then my dad decided to break the news to his parents that he now had a wife. My grandfather hit the roof because he said, "What? How can you get married there? That's not, you know, you 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 didn't do a Muslim ceremony, therefore you're not married." And he refused to see my mother,、um, but my grandmother, my grandmother turned around and told her husband, "Well, you're not going to go see your new grand,、um, daughter-in-law. I'm going." So she decided to get into a car and came down to KL to meet my mom,、um, you know. But eventually, I think my my dad caved and my mom caved、uh, to pressure, and they had a, a nikah, you know, a Muslim ceremony. It's a little tea party with ten people, so they never really had like a big grand wedding. So、uh, much much later, I think during their fortieth anniversary. Um, us kids, we sprung a big surprise party on them and had the whole. You know how in Malay weddings they have the palamin or the dais、mm-hmm. where the bride and groom sit and people go and bless. Yes,、yeah, so we made them go do that. Oh, sweet! Forty <laughs> years late. Forty years late. Was that in Langkawi? No, no, that was in KL.、Um, so all their friends came, and you know they were really surprised. We managed to fly in at that point in time. Some of my mother's siblings.、Um, yeah, it was great. That is so sweet. Wow. So I suppose your your dad was a、um, a very confident fella as well. I mean, to have flown all the way there. I mean, if she maybe he figured that was like the only way. My dad is not exactly the most orthodox human being. Let's put it that way. <laughs> he's, he's, you know, a bit of a rebel. I mean, I tell people this as like, no matter how badly behaved you think I am, you have not met my father, because unlike him, none of his children have ever been jailed. <laughs> Ooh, but you say that proudly. 
Yeah, because, well, he was a political detainee, right? He was he was detained under the Internal Security Act for apparently inciting students to riot. So it, I mean, it wasn't a crime; it was a you know political crime, which you know in my books is is you know part of the course. <laughs> it's fighting fighting for freedom, Ross. Exactly, or you know rights. In this case, it was uh, settlers' rights. Any are there any authors in your family? Oh uh, well, my my dad's published, but you know academically, um, he's an academic. He's written academic books. Um, uh, a, a lot to do with his line of work um, in geography. He did a lot of work that had to do with uh, urban migration from the rural areas. Um, he also worked very closely with my uncle who headed Felda at the time um, to document some of the, the the kind of expansion and development of Felda and the Felda settlers. So, um, if if you could share, Karina, your daddy's name, so that if anybody is interested, they could go and look up his white papers. His name is Tunku Shamsul Barin, and he's a geographer. Uh, I don't know what his white papers are called, though. <laughs> Have you read them? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go Google and find them. <laughs> and and mummy's name. Mummy's name before she got married was Flor G. Robles, Flor Gloria Robles. Um, and then when she became a Muslim, her Muslim name is Farida Abdullah. So depending on who you talk to and what they call her, you kind of know. You know which part of her they know. This tapestry is just so rich, man. I mean, culturally, <laughs> it's it's really Southeast Asia. Yeah. <laughs> Grandma Wan Pute from Daddy's side, and and the husband moved to KL. Uh, they mo- they only moved to KL in, in the nineteen eighties when they were old because mm. their children wanted them to be you know closer to doctors. But mm. otherwise, they were pretty much in Kuala Pila the whole time. I mean, the house I used to visit them in in, in the village was the same house that my par- my dad grew up in. And mummy's parents uh, in the Philippines did they did they move or did they? S- stay on over there or did they travel elsewhere? Um, well, I know that the province is where I see her. I mean, there's a town called Cabanatuan. Um, I believe it's probably already a city now. Uh, but they might have moved around a little bit because my mother did not always live with them. You know, she has an older sister that she she kind of lived with at some point, whom she even uh, you know, used to refer to as mommy. Uh, well, that was mommy sixteen. Was so she large. she was number sixteen, so this older exactly. sister must have been like you know. She had an older sister who was you know once the older sister got married and stuff. When my mother was in college, for example, she did live with that older sister. I mean, I have cousins who are not very far, who were my mom's playmates, for example. Um, and my mom also tells me stories about how she was basically the chaperone of every single one of her siblings when they were courting. So it was her and her brother, her immediate brother, the two of them. You know, the grand, the, my grandma would kind of plant them there in front of that the, the dating couple. So that's how it would happen, right? So the, yeah, yeah. the dating couple, and then you'll have somebody just basically watching over you. Yeah, well, two little kids are gonna <laughs> rat on your view. You know, so she said the good thing is, you know, sometimes she got bribed by them, right, to kind of turn the other way or something. So she, yeah, we got sweets and you know <laughs> things. Things you do. <laughs> I should say if they go to the movie, you should have to sit in between. Yeah, I think that happened to my mom as well. I remember some stories, something sure. like that. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> that's what they used to do. I mean, try it now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but now they don't have to. They just track their kids on their mobile phones. <laughs> if they let lie, you. Right? <laughs> if they let you. Yeah, well, if mommy pays the phone bill, you, you probably have to let her. <laughs> <laughs> Your grandma Wan Pute was uh, educated. What about your mum's mum? Would you know? Uh, I don't really know, but no, I'm I'm pretty sure she was educated because actually in the Philippines, a lot of the the rate of education literacy is quite high. Yes, you know, it's very high. But you know, those days, women traditionally would get married and become you know sort of homemakers, I guess. So you know, class with sixteen children, that's like I don't know how many jobs all at once, right? How can you have a career? God. Oh, that would be amazing. Can you imagine? You're juggling like a career. Madness. And, yeah. And six you'd have that you'd need a lot of help. Yep. And money, I think. I mean that's to be able to work. That's pretty much your whole life. Hmm. Caring and minding yeah. children. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, even Amazing. even my mom, you know, she she was a she was a professor, right? She was with ITM, uh, the Maya Institute of Technology, and she was a lecturer there. Um, and she worked till she retired, and she cared for us as well. So I, you could see how you know these sort of super women of the '80s. I don't envy them. I mean, they, these moms they have it tough, man. Even though you know, of course, you had help, you know, maybe housekeepers or whoever to, to help out. But still, I mean, they work nine to five jobs, and and there was no internet. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> and, and there was no grab food and there was no Uber. You know, there's mm-hmm. none of all those ancillary things that can help. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, you you had to carpool, you had to deal with your kids, you had to come back and run the household and everything. Let, let's round that up to you now, your early career, right? Mm-hmm. What were you doing when you first graduated? What was like one of your first few jobs? Oh, um, so I came back and I just got whatever job I could first. Uh, that didn't last very long, a couple of months. Uh, and then um, a, a friend of mine said, oh, you're interested in, in public relations. Um, she happened to work at, at the time, I think, at Leo Burnett and Edelman, the PR agency, was in the same building. Mm-hmm. So she asked someone um, over there whether there was an opening, just so happened there was. And I went in for an interview and that's how my career in PR started. Initially... Oh, okay. So this is going back to you know university, right? So when I got the scholarship from the government, um, I actually told my dad I wanted to be a journalist, but you know the government wasn't about to pay for a communications degree. You know they weren't interested in funding a communications degree. And my dad said, "Well, actually, if you're going to be a reporter, go study a subject so you actually know it quite well, and you can be you know an authoritative writer on the subject." I thought that's quite smart. Um, then I also had to consider the possibility of having to work for the government. Yeah, right? Because to, at to that time, back. it came with a 10-year ten, a ten year bond. It was 10 years. And I thought, okay, which part of the government can I stomach? I mean, that, that was basically my consideration. Mm-hmm. And I decided maybe the diplomatic call. If I'm really forced to that, you know, at least I might be posted somewhere else and I don't have to deal with, you know, <laughs> all that it is. So I decided to study political science, right? And then when I came out, uh, the government was actually trying to trim down the civil service and they released many of the scholarship students from their bonds. So I was very lucky. I said, okay, so now I can go be a reporter. Then I discovered that reporters are very poor. And I said, okay, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> And then okay. I ended up in PR, which at the time paid better. Okay, okay. Yeah. So and it was still allowed me to write. It was pretty much PR agency. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I could still write, right? Which is what I wanted to do. So, what what were those um, memorable signature projects that you enjoyed the most? <laughs> Actually, some of the funnest ones are the crises where you don't get to sleep. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> you know, those those are uh, nothing I mean, of the ha- rule book. You gotta, yeah. you gotta reinvent the wheel, basically, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and you're doing a lot of kind of reactive work, and and uh, those are exciting. Mm-hmm. And, and I've had to handle a couple of those. Um, I think those stand out, and, and that requires you to be able to keep a really level head. I think at at the point when everything's falling apart, and by falling apart, I mean I remember at one time Tanaga National was our client, and there had been a nationwide blackout. The black, the big blackout. Yes, yes. So I was on, you know, I mean, I was a junior member, but I was on on the team. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, when I was at the stock exchange, the exchange stopped working <laughs> for a day. And yeah. this is uh, actually called Bursa Malaysia, just for yeah, our Bursa Malaysia listeners. Is, is the Malaysian stock exchange. It actually stopped working. The the trading engine just did not function for an entire day. Goodness gracious! Uh, which is the worst possible thing that can happen to a stock exchange. So what was what was the communication? I was very fortunate because the CEO that I was working with, you know, is really really decent chap and and really good with with listening and taking on counsel. Um, you know, uh, so he made my job a lot easier. Um, and, and I think at the time, the management team was also very cooperative because they took the lead from the CEO, right? I suppose at that time, we didn't have social media. Did we? This would have been um, somewhere around 2000. Between two, I was there between 2004, 2008. So yeah, maybe not so much social media, but you know, there was already online media. Probably yeah. ICQ. Uh-oh. 
Yeah, but online media was already there, yeah. so the, you know, reporters were requiring you know really quick turnarounds and things like that. You were involved in concerts as well. Now, when I was at one of the agencies, um, because uh, do you remember Eight TV, yes. the network? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we were uh, the agency that I was in, that I was heading at the time, um, was was one of the, the PR agencies supporting the the Media Prima group. Um, so. When uh, Media Prima were one of the one of the partners with the Force of Nature concert, which is a big benefit concert that was done after the tsunami, so they got us involved. That was quite exciting, and also because ATV was uh, was the the franchise, I, I guess, holder for um, 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 Malaysian Idol, the Idol series. That's right. Yes. So yeah, I worked on the first one. I remember that. Who was the winner for for the first uh, one? Uh, Jacqueline Victor. I remember being given an EP by Ivy Josia, and she said to me, "Cause at that time I was dabbling in music promotion and she said hey Jasmine uh, have a listen to this and it was Jacqueline Victor and see how far she's come today <laughs> yeah I mean I was there at the finals at the arena of stars with the reporters and all the fans I was yeah, it was exciting. She's done so well for herself. Such a diva yeah. today. Malaysia's vo- you know one of Malaysia's diva voices. Well she's got a fantastic voice. Yeah, so, yeah she's know, amazing. She does. Do you sing Karina? Oh uh, no. <laughs> I know, right? People go, but you're Filipino. No, no. <laughs> that was not my intention, but you have a very, very nice deep voice. So I was. <laughs> I always tell people my parents brought me up to believe that I could do anything, that, you know, the, us children, the three of us, could do anything we set our minds to, right? I mean, there was never, a, oh no, you can't do that. Um, and I always tell my friends, hey, you're very lucky, you know. I didn't decide to become some figure skater, dancer, singer, because then you would have to endure really bad versions of those things because of me. Because I would think, no, I can. <laughs> do you remember having conversation with a, a, a journalist actually about this, where people just think that they can and they do it yeah. but then the results are, they just do it right but the results are not necessarily well we could even boil it down to this podcast because I'm just like I think I can I'm doing it no I mean you know you know, <laughs> kudos to people who just go ahead and do it right I, I think there's a lot of that in me as well I mean what did I do I just chucked in everything packed up dogs sold the house opened a hotel why because I can't I mean I know what you mean. Just yeah, decided to write a book. Why? Because I can't. So, where does that bravado come from? It must come from parents, right? It must come from somewhere. What was I told it? You. They 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 never put limits on us. Yep. So like, yeah, 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 go ahead. You know, they never said no. In that sense. Yeah. Do you have a website? Um, on Instagram, it's uh, Karina Robles Barin. On Facebook, it's the same. So it's uh, Karina, K A R I N A. N A. Robles is R O B L E S. R O B L E S. Barin is B A H R I N. Yeah. So we can search you up on Instagram or Facebook. Yes. Okay, and the books. So the accidental Malay. How did you come up with such a cute title? No. <laughs> That actually wasn't the original title, but it was a different title. And then I think the publisher felt um, that we needed something catchier. So there was a lot of back and forth between me and and the the editor and the publisher. And I think this is something we finally all agreed on. And it's 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 one of the titles that I coined, and, and they said yes. Um, I I thought that it is quite illustrative of the story. Um, and I thought it was also quite catchy. I mean, it's a bit pro- provocative, right? If you, if you look at it, go, how can somebody be accidentally Malay? So, Samo <laughs> Bakwa, yeah. CEO. You didn't name her after me, did you? I'm just kidding. You know, she just became Jasmine. Right? Uh-huh. Really funny. Really she funny had story. to be a Jasmine. Like, yeah, and I'm like, I actually know a Jasmine, right? The worst part is, there's a character in the book called Lao Kuan Yu. <laughs> okay. I mean, the Kuan Yu bit, obviously, is just me kind of being naughty with the Singaporean Prime Minister's name. But I was writing the book, you know, and, and this Lao Kuan Yu character in the book is sort of this this athletic jock, you know, kind of, kind of stocky guy with a booming voice, right? And he's this quite pivotal character. So I'm writing the book, and then two-thirds through the book, I realised, oh my god, I know why that sounds familiar. <laughs> That's the Chinese name of my ex-boss. <laughs> 
it's funny how things just embed in the memory. No, bank. so I had to tell him. I was like, "Hey, listen, um, you know, I mean, he's, you know, he goes by Lionel, right? Lionel Lau, and he's also from Ipo, which the characters from. Okay, and he also has a booming voice. I was like, "Hey, listen, <laughs> I need to tell you that when this book comes out, there's this character. Please tell your wife it is not you. <laughs> it's fiction. I mean, I really, I didn't." I, I accidentally used your name. It's really embarrassing. But uh, I can imagine how much fun you must have had coming up with this, this book. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Did fun. Did you consult family members or did you consult anybody? No, nope. <laughs> not really. It was all in the head. It all yeah, had to lot, come up. Uh, a lot of talking to myself. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm, I'm so, so happy for you. Seriously. I mean, your first attempt and then you go and win this prize. Tell us about, I mean, what, what even possessed you to say, hey, let me just throw this in and see if I can get it into the Epigram book prize. Well, okay. So um, while I was writing the book, I was also taking a, an online course, right, at this uh, site called The Novel Read. And it's a really good site for people who are considering writing novels or improving their craft. It's a, it's a really good site. And as I was doing that and, and understanding, you know, kind of the business side of publishing, I, I was also starting to realize, and I don't think I'm very wrong in this, that a book like mine would have difficulty finding its audience within the, the traditional Western publishing world. You know, of course, a lot of, of tutors will say, no, no, you just write the best book that you can. I'll always find its audience. I'm like, bullshit lah. Okay, quite honestly, a book from Malaysia will probably find Western publishing placement if it has ghosts or it has some colonial element in it. Contemporary story, a little bit hard. Um, and if you look at kind of the canon of, of Malaysian literature that's made it out, in, that's being published by the Big Four, or big five publishers, a lot of it does contain either, you know, colonials or ghosts or both. Right? Because that's still, unfortunately, a stereotype. Uh, they're not really ready for kind of contemporary stories about us. Not, not you know, I, I really don't think they are. So nevertheless, after I'd finished the whole editing process, I, I thought, hey, you know what? I need to learn how to do this. So I went and tried to query the book with, um, you know, the Western agents anyways in the US and the UK. There were two or three that actually requested the full manuscripts and then they came back and said, I don't think it's a right fit for us, as I anticipated. And then I said, okay, what am I going to do with this now? Um, let's try and see who might be able to pick it up regionally. And as you know, in Southeast Asia, the regional publishers, there are not that many. And around about that time, I kind of spotted the Epigram Award. I thought, I'll just give it a shot. Lah. <laughs> you never know, right? to do the submission and I guess the little story behind that one is um, I was trying to do it you know during the pandemic when it was locked down and, and things were still very limited so one of the requirements is that you actually have to submit hard copy comb bound uh, books you know of the manuscript I'm like where am I going to get that done in Langkawi during <laughs> pandemic so, you know, I even considered sending it across to someone in Singapore and asking them for a giant favor to do it for me there. But it ended up, I was finally able to do it here and, and courier it out, I think, just in the nick of time. And when was that? Back in 2021? Aug August, maybe. 20 I think that's their deadline. Oh, that's there. really quick. So from August 2021 to where we are today, with congratulations, Karina. <laughs> Thank you. What, what a coup. Well done. Unexpected, but hey, I'll take it. <laughs> Have you decided what to read? Yeah. And what will you be reading? So I'm going to read you the second half of The Proper Care of Princesses, which is from this lovely yellow book. Um, it's a fairy tale. I'm going to be reading you an excerpt from a fairy tale that I wrote titled The Proper Care of Princesses, which was published in a book called Malaysian Tales, Retold and Remixed by ZI Publishing, and that was published in uh, 2011. So this story is actually a reinterpretation of the, the myth of Putri Sadong, a Malaysian princess who was very well known for her beauty, who despite the fact that she was married, was still kind of coveted by the king of Siam. So at one point he actually captured her 
and, and you know, held her prisoner in his palace in Ayutthaya. Um, so the proper care of princesses actually begins when the king of Siam releases Putri Sadong and says, okay, fine, you, you can leave now, you can go back to your hometown. So what happens in my version of the story is the minute she leaves Ayutthaya, she, for some unexplainable reason, starts to increase in size. Uh, she starts growing really large right? and, and she and the entourage are just really puzzled they don't know what to do until you know, at some point in their journey they then uh, come across a mermaid huh, who's kind of beached and the mermaid decides to join their entourage so this is what happens um, when she's encountered the mermaid right At nightfall, in her cavernous tent, Princess Sadong summoned the mermaid in desperation. The creature did not balk at her highness's appearance, but instead clasped the princess's now large little finger with her own tiny hands. Princess Sadong was overwhelmed. It had been days since anyone had smiled at her. Tell me, young mermaid, why am I now so large? The mermaid smiled. I am as old as the sea. Every 1,000 years, the currents push me to shore. I cannot return home until I have rescued a princess in need. Princess Sado wondered if she qualified. Her captivity in Ayutthaya had been longer than anticipated, but she had not been unhappy there. Away from the clutches of her suffocating mother, she had flourished. In the absence of her dull husband, she had discovered a taste for men who were quick with conversation and ardent listeners to her stories. She had tasted foods unheard of in her own kingdom, slumbered peacefully after jugs of heady wine, all while ensconced in a beautiful castle filled with golden urns and polished floors of terracotta tile. But what is it that ails me? pressed the princess. Nights were humid in tropical jungles, and her growing girth caused her to sweat profusely. Oh! You are afflicted by unhappiness, the mermaid declared. You don't want to go home. The only problem is, no one gets to take a vacation from her real life forever, especially not someone like you, who has a kingdom to rule. Now your mother is gone, you are your people's only salvation. Salvation? The princess frowned, licking the salty dampness from her upper lip. Yes, said the mermaid. Your husband is a dullard. But I think you already know that. He's incapable of little else besides decorating. Princess Sadon considered the mermaid's judgment of her other half. Remembering her husband's enthusiasm for the previous palace move, she supposed the sea creature was correct. Raja Abdullah had labored over each pillowcase, arranging and rearranging them himself in the throne room before anyone else was allowed in. Even the ladies in waiting used to giggle behind his back. I expect he squandered all my mother's wealth by now on something frivolous, uttered Princess Sato. Oh, worse, your highness, said the mermaid. Not only have your riches gone to the tailors from Golgathi, all the pots in your lawn are now coated with gold leaf. The princess was enraged. She had plans for her fortune and they did not include pots. Her breast inflated at her fury, obscuring her face. She gasped arms flailing, attempting to part them. Oh dear, said the mermaid, mildly alarmed. You really need to find an outlet for all this frustration. Break a plate, she offered. The princess peered from behind her mountainous bosom. Those brass things? Doesn't one require a hammer? Ah, yes, the mermaid said. You don't quite have porcelain where you come from, do you? I suppose the Chinese haven't made their way to Jumbal yet, the mermaid said, thinking aloud. Here, I think you can do some damage with this. She plucked a white bird from her billowing hair. The princess, propped up on her elbows, reached out for the winged creature. It appeared real, but was in fact lifeless. It's a porcelain dove, explained the mermaid. Except I wouldn't suggest you smash it with your bare hands. Perhaps you can use one of your brass plates. 
Princess Sadong had never heard of such magic. Previous encounters with her mother's countless shamans only involved drinking copious potions and rubbing ointments across her forehead and sometimes nether regions. But not one to be deterred by unfamiliar practices, she set the bird on the ground and seizing a large brass dish, banged it down hard on the figurine. Her mother would never have approved of such wanton destruction. The bird shattered into pieces, eliciting a small cry of surprise from the princess. Superb, laughed the mermaid, clapping her hands. Now I can see you again. The princess's breasts had deflated to their normal proportions. How is it you have become so wise, mermaid, she asked. The sea woman smiled, stroking the princess's hair. Don't you know what mermaids are for, she said. Singing to sailors, ventured the princess. Ha <laughs> ha, that, oh, that's for amateurs, said the mermaid. Our real job is to ensure the proper care of princesses. How do you think all the legendary ones survived? It isn't easy, you know, overcoming the boredom of being virtuous all the time for the sake of posterity. Princess Sando was intrigued. It never occurred to her before then that famous princesses of yore had received any help. She was brought up to believe a princess's role was to be a model to her citizens, a paragon of virtue, someone for the women of her kingdom to look up to and for men to revere. Oh, the problem with you lot, said the mermaid, running her fingers through the princess's hair, is that you are taught to bottle everything up. This whole be seen and not heard thing is for statues, in my opinion. From what I've observed over the years, it definitely doesn't suit princesses. Um, but can we fix me by morning? said Sadong, worried. The wise men of Ayutthaya had informed her earlier that they expected to arrive in Jambal by the next midday. No problem, said the mermaid, walking towards the dark corner of the tent. She threw the princess a large wooden stick. Whatever I hurl at you, just hit it with all your might. At first, it was difficult for the large princess who could afford little except to position herself in a half-supine state. But she managed. Glass animals of all shapes and sizes flew across the room. The elephants reminded her of her mother. She hit those with calm precision, halving them in two with determined swings. The cheetahs, hyenas, and vultures were a little trickier due to their unpredictable flight patterns, just like the sidling members of the Jambal court. But after a while, she mastered those too. The cranes were the least problematic, the princess smashing those to smithereens every time she thought of her husband's gold leaf pots. With each successful hit, a part of her body subsided to its original condition. Soon her tent was littered with debris and only a handful of mist creatures lay intact on the floor. As the moon reached its apex, Princess Sadong was restored. Her once again lithe figure was lost in the swath of cloth that had previously enveloped her. Clawing her way out, she emerged from the mountain of silk and cotton, completely nude, devoid even of her oversized undergarments. Emboldened by the dark of night, Princess Sadong lifted the flap of her tent and peered outside. It was quiet, apart from the singing of winged crickets and the sonorous snoring of her entourage in their own tents. She thought of slipping away before daylight bound her once more to the duties that awaited her in Jambal. But she had promised to help the mermaid return home. And besides, there was that matter of the gold leaf pots to settle with Abdullah. So instead, she turned down her tent flap and curled up in her pile of large clothes, wrapping a sleeve around her slim torso. The mermaid, still in her batting corner, was sound asleep, humming, as was customary for slumbering mermaids to, a foreign melody that reminded Sato of the sea. The princess shut her eyes and dreamed of Ayutthaya. Thank you very much, Karina. That was lovely. <laughs> so we're, while we're all lost in Ayutthaya right now... <laughs> Thank you, Tori Makase. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed Thanks for it. Having me, it was good fun. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to read a, a little press announcement that came out in uh, Yahoo News. Actually, it was in Malay Mail. 
So the title was Malaysian Writer of the Accidental Malay Wins 2022 Southeast Asian Book Prize. January 23rd, Malaysian Karina Robles Bahrain emerged the winner of the Epigram Books Fiction Prize 2022, besting three other finalists from Singapore for the Singapore dollar 25,000 prize money. And it goes on to say, there's a little quote from you. And then it says, uh, this is your quote, Karina. I'd like to firstly congratulate all the other shortlisted finalists. I think their books sound fantastic and I'm really looking forward to reading them. And to Epigram, a big thank you to them for continuing to push on and still have this award available to Southeast Asian writers despite challenges of the current times. Indeed so, right? I mean, despite everything else, they went on with it. Exactly, and, and even so, more they should have yeah. actually come up with more because I'm sure there was quite a lot of entries. I wonder how many entries there were. Um, I think there were 62 in total, and around about half were non-Singaporean. Right, yeah. and then you go on to say in this press release, <laughs> so funny that I'm reading you. Last but not least, of course. Thank you to the judges for selecting my story, said Karina, who also runs a hotel, restaurant, farm and community storytelling initiative on the island of Langkawi. Karina is the second Malaysian to win the regional award after Joshua Kam in 2020 with his novel How the Man in Green Saved Pahang and Possibly the World. So the accidental Malay tells the story of Jasmine Leong, a workaholic who is dead set on becoming the next chief executive of a bar coin in brackets pork jerky company owned by the wealthy Leong clan. But one day, she discovers that she's Malay. On that note, you have been listening to Jasmine Lowe's Audio Journey Experience, an AFT podcast production. Subscribe to the podcast on your preferred platform and if you'd like to encourage us on, find out how you can support the production by visiting us on the website listenbyheart.webprojects.com. The Listen by Heart podcast is an audio project that sets up to record and archive stories from women of the South China Sea, an area of much interest lately. As we document and record all of these stories, we will also be digitizing and creating an online presence for women of Southeast Asian heritage and honoring the women and men who came before them. Our mission is to serve as the sentinels of the South China Sea, keeping our region at peace. Would you have a tale to share or know somebody who does? Do you identify as a woman with heritage from the nations encircling the contentious South China Sea? Wherever you are in the world, we'd love to hear from you. Send us a voice message. Thank you and see you next time.